ready. I see some of my patients here. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Ah, <laughs> but, no. um, some of them came and said hi to you. But, um, my, my background is in sports medicine, and I've been teaching um, yoga injury prevention for the last 30, 2011, mm -hmm. 2012. The way that I get interested in yoga is actually about three, four years into my practice, I was sending people to rehabilitation for their conditions, and I just felt that movement-based education was not being done well in the rehab world. And so I started exploring using Pilates and yoga in my rehabilitation model. And does anybody know about the Hippocratic Oath? Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. the first principle of the Hippocratic Oath? Do no harm. Do no harm. <laughs> So I thought that Pilates and yoga was great with respect to rehabilitation, but what I started to see were injury patterns were also occurring, and if something I'm recommending to clients or patients and they get injured from it, then that's exactly against the principle that I am supposed to be working under. And I understand in yoga there's a similar, similar principle, which is called... Ahimsa. Right. So I think <laughs> we all are in the same wavelength about it, but just what I want to reiterate is that the reason that I got interested in yoga injury prevention is from the standpoint of I believe that yoga is helpful um, for my patients, but I also want to make sure my patients are safe doing yoga. And so, like, how many here are yoga teachers? Okay, and teacher trainees? Okay, so, I mean, th this group then has probably seen <laughs> different things occur. And I think the one thing I noticed when I started looking at yoga injuries, because when I went to Diane in 2011, November, I said to her, hey, Diane, I used to go to Diane's classes at Downward Dog. I'm not supposed to mention names, right? But Downward Dog gave this to me. So I came, so I was always intimidated to approach Diane because she was such a, you know, she looked like a drill sergeant up there. But I came up to her once. Um, I got to after class once and I asked Diane, I said, hey, um, can we talk about yoga research? I didn't want to say the word injury because I was worried that you know, this is her livelihood, this is what she does, she owned the studio. I didn't want her to feel that, you know, I was coming at her. But I started engaging her on talking about yoga research, and then I started asking Diane, hey, I'm seeing these injuries occur from yoga, the same injuries are occurring over and over again. And um, I was kind of like, is she going to be mad <laughs> for me saying this? But actually, Diane was pretty open-minded about it. Um, I, had a, I had a bad experience, again, not mentioning names, where... <laughs> Um, early on, I started taking yoga also about a decade ago, and I remember being in a class, and it was a snowy day, and there weren't many people in the class because it was a snowy day, and there was all these hardcore people who had been coming to the class for years, and I was relatively new, and the teacher said, okay, we're going to do handstands in the middle of the room. And I don't think I've ever done a handstand. <laughs> and I was very uncomfortable, so I said, hey, can I do it against the wall? And he's like, oh, no, you're strong. Just kick up. Just kick up. So I kicked up. And I remember the guy was wavering, not such a big guy, <laughs> holding my legs up, and I fell right over and broke my toe. So that was my first experience of a yoga injury. I kept going because I thought that's just a one-off, you know, freak occurrence. But in the end, I think what I'm seeing mostly now in my practice are a lot of repetitive injuries, meaning people doing the same thing over and over and over again, which leads to a problem. Um, so about... 2011, I started more formally collecting injury data on my patients so I could analyze what were the injuries occurring because there wasn't much in the literature and there seemed to be a lot of trends occurring, especially with Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, where certain injuries were creeping up. And I thought to myself, if these injuries are due to repetitive strain and we can address the mechanism of the injury, can we reduce the injuries? Because we know, let's say someone gets kicked in the face or someone falls over. I mean, there's not as much you can do about that, but a lot of the injuries appeared to be preventable. And that's when I started talking to Dan about yoga injuries. And she, I think at that point, if I had talked to you maybe five years earlier, you might not have been so open about oh, it. Oh, no, yeah. I would not have been. We wouldn't be talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She'd be like, you know, you should go down to the beginner class. <laughs> maybe this isn't for you. But um, when I approached Dan, she was fairly um, open-minded about it. And I think because she had been injured herself and she had been seeing a lot of things going on, and so we started talking about different types of injuries, and then we started this yoga injury prevention module, which was in, it was interesting timing because we were working on that between November 2011 and January 2012. The workshop was slated in mid-January 2012, and then the William Broad, does anybody know about the William Broad article? Yeah. Um, not good journalism, but I think a wake-up call. Um, 
that there were problems occurring. And our workshop occurred two weeks. It just so happened that his article came out two weeks before our workshop. And so it was, so it was just, it was weird. The timing just occurred. Um, and so that workshop sold out. And a lot of people were interested in what we had to say. And I think that's how we started. Um, so I've, I've basically been, does any, did, I don't know if anybody knows Ricky Richter. She's in the black. Um, so Ricky and I opened up together because I wanted to incorporate yoga and Pilates in my sports clinic. Um, but Ricky and I opened up together um, a clinic called Synergy where we incorporated yoga and Pilates into our rehabilitation model. And we have seven Pilates yoga teachers at our center. So we've been extensively using yoga and Pilates in our rehab model, but we also felt it was important to disseminate back to you guys, the yoga community, what type of injuries are we seeing from yoga practice. And we're hoping that you know, with this type of information and dialogue will help to reduce injuries. And, and I, was, I want to stress also that I'm not saying that yoga has more injuries than other activities because, I mean, 70% of runners are injured every season. The, the rate is even higher for basketball players. And the seriousness of the injuries in general is not the way that William Broad portrays, but I think anytime you're doing any type of activity, um, it behooves you to really see what it is that you're doing, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. If injuries are occurring, how can we do our best to prevent it? Because I think a lot of people going to yoga are going into it to improve their health and well-being. And so if an injury sidetracks them for two or three months, really goes against their goals, I don't really think that that's what they were looking for. And a lot of, a lot of physicians are, in fact, recommending yoga for their patients. And they're telling their patients to go to yoga, but what they may be picturing of yoga is maybe a very gentle stretching for an older patient or someone who's overweight. They're not expecting people, I think, you know, jumping through, jumping back, doing balances, doing headstands, handstands. I mean, I think, I think in the sense of there's so many different types of yoga. And so um, I think it's very important then for us to have that kind of dialogue. And we've been teaching, we, we did that first one in 2012, January, and we've gone to different yoga studios and deadness injury prevention and I see more and more light bulbs going off in the room but the first time I did it I felt a lot of pushback like okay you know the, the, you know this is what we've been doing for years and then when we brought up the injury mechanisms but then the next time we go I think people are are, are um, seeing uh, more in terms of ideas of what we're saying so what I actually did was um, the basis of that yoga injury prevention were, was looking at my own case data because there's not a lot of literature in yoga but um, what I did now is actually, this is hot off the press, but I had a student in this week and she was going through some cases and these are 75 cases and I wanted to share with you guys some statistics that I'm seeing and the type of injuries um, and hopefully that will um, open up some discussion. So I apologize, I usually use slides, but I have to a little bit read off the paper here. So we had, um, we have probably more than 100 injuries that we've tracked and but I think out of this 75, so 70% were women, 30% men. I think that is the demographic in this room. I think that's the demographic in a lot of yoga studios I've seen. So that's not surprising. The average age was 40. Mm -hmm. So you had some younger and some older, but a lot of 40-year-olds. So I think, again, that's not surprising. That's probably the demographic, the average age of a lot of yogis. So any guess as to the most commonly affected body part? Is it the wrist? Is it the yes. knee? OK, yes. hamstring. Anybody else? Shoulders. Shoulders. Wrists. Wrist. Wrist. Back. Yeah, so the number one in our data set was lumbar spine. And so low back was 40% of injuries. Now, and there were mostly disc herniations or disc bulges and or sciatica. And it's interesting because Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga is heavily focused on forward bends. And I think that is why, because we get a lot of Ashtanga Yoga practitioners in our clinic, coming to our clinic. So that 40%, low back disc injuries take months and months to heal. And that is one of the biggest things. And the other thing that was surprising was, I used to think intuitively that it would be men who are inflexible in their hamstrings, when they were bending forward, would round their back a lot, and they'd get the disc injuries. But it was actually 100% opposite of that. Guess which group had the highest risk of lumbar disc injuries in our, in our population? It was women who were hypermobile. It made no sense to me thinking, if you're so hypermobile, if your hamstrings are so flexible, why are you rounding your back? But what was happening was a lot of them were going to the end range of a pose. And you know the type of 
female who would go into dance or yoga is already very flexible, well, the teacher will go over and encourage further. So they're, they're pushing into the end range of a pose even further. And it's interesting that those populations were getting more, more uh, low back injuries. And those injuries take months and months to heal. Second common, as someone mentioned, was knee. And that was 20% of our population. And in that case, as you mentioned, like a lot of it was because the hips were tight. So it's occurring more in males than females. And a lot of cartilage tears occurring in the knees. Some of which would, would require surgery because cartilage doesn't heal well, but many of them requiring, again, six to eight weeks to heal. Third common, as someone mentioned, was shoulder, 15%. And this was very common in women who did weight-bearing type poses or shtanga vinyasa yoga. And I think probably they didn't have the same upper body strength as the men. And the neck was 10%. Can anybody guess what poses are causing the neck? <laughs> yeah, shoulder stand and head stand are the two big ones. And then, of course, we had the hamstring, wrist. I got a couple of nerve injuries, et cetera. So that, was, so that was the kind of body parts affected. Low back, knee, shoulder, neck. Now, guess what percentage of my data set were yoga teachers? <laughs> because when you think about it, if I'm a basketball coach, if I'm a volleyball coach, if I'm a soccer coach, I should know the mechanisms well. I should have good technique playing basketball. I shouldn't make the rookie mistakes, right? But guess how much work, guess what percentage? It's not as high as I'm making it out to be, but guess what percentage? 20%, which is still high considering these are all comers, right? So, but one, one in five being yoga teachers, when I'm thinking that, you know, how many times does a basketball coach come in for an injury? Because usually when people are into something for a long time, they know what to do and what not to do with their body. But I found with the yoga, t to me, what this really says is probably a lot of the injury mechanisms are from overuse. That means if you do the same thing day after day after day, and it's many of the yoga teachers who are doing daily practice. The average Joe or Jill off the street wasn't doing six days of practice. You told me you were doing, well, you just said you were doing two six, or three. Six days a week. Right, two to three hours. Yeah. So <clears throat> if she ran, if she ran for, I don't know, 10 kilometers six days a week, she'd have a problem. If she played basketball six right. days a week, unless she's 20 years old, um, she'll have a problem. So I think part of what I was seeing was there was a lot of overuse from doing the same thing. And the other thing I noticed with Shastanga Vinyasa Yoga is this: it's not only that they're doing it six days a week, it's the same exact poses day after day using the same muscles, the same restrictions are occurring, the same. So I know yoga is supposed to pose and counter pose balance, but obviously there was some type of uh, mechanism occurring where it wasn't leading to that. So that was kind of an interesting thing. In terms of injury mechanisms, you can also trace it to an increase in yoga. So 45% of the injuries were from increase in yoga, which again makes me think a lot of it's from repetitive strain. 25% were from specific yoga poses. I'll get into poses in a minute that are high risk in our data set. 5% during teacher training. A lot of came from workshops and weekend retreats. And then 3% from harsh adjustment, which there was one that I was just kind of like, so there was one about, so someone was in child's pose. And the woman told me someone stepped on her back. So she's already, I knew she was hypermobile because she tested hypermobile on every joint. So she was in child's pose and someone stepped with both their feet on her back. So there's someone, I don't know how heavy, standing on her back. Um, but anyway, that, thankfully that was only 3%. Um, but it's interesting because if you look at the frequency of yoga practice and the injuries, 40% of the people were practicing three times per week or more. And so I think, again, this is, this is just pointing towards overuse type injuries for me. Now, guess which pose... And these are mostly Ashtanga Vinyasa. Guess which pose had the most um, most likely to cause an injury? Which pose? Chaturanga. Sorry, I... <laughs> Push-up, Chaturanga. Push-up, Chaturanga, okay. Upward dog. Upward dog. But vis-a-vis -vis what I said is the most common injury. Yeah, so forward bends were 30%. So 30% came from doing a forward bend. And those are typically common in... Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, like a lot of the standing and seated and the sun salutation involves forward bends. 10% from back bends, 10% from rotation, and as you guys mentioned, 7% through weight bearing through arms. Now these are the other, so that's kind of the general mechanism. Now these poses were, were coming up frequently. So pigeon was causing a lot of 
issues with the knee. Headstand was causing a lot of issues with the neck. Arm balances was causing shoulder issues. Arm binds were caused, so forced internal rotation was causing shoulder issues. Lotus was causing knee issues. Warrior one was causing knee issues. Crow was causing shoulder and wrist. Shoulder stand was causing neck. Navasana, I don't remember what the, is that boat, the boat pose? Yeah. Okay. Um, Navasana, I'm not sure exactly. The child's pose was from that standing on the back. Um, a couple from reaching overhead. Hero, again, causing knee issues. Downward dog, shoulders, wrists, plank, and chaturanga, shoulders, wrists. So those are the typical kinds of poses that have been high risk. And in the, in the other literature you read, it also says similar things. Um, the one I saw this week that was just really different was this guy was in India and he was doing, what is the pose where you're rotating your upper arms on your outside of your knee and his, his wrist went limp for three days and it went numb and then it got better. Then he went back to doing the same pose for two minutes and his wrist went limp again. And he actually compressed, he was the thin guy, but he, were, he compressed a nerve in the upper arm, the radial nerve, which brings the wrist up and that it got better over a few weeks but it's interesting because I'm also starting to see some nerve injuries from prolonged poses causing pressure so um, so those are the kind of th I'm gonna mine this data further and I think in June we're doing some injury prevention stuff we're, we're gonna we, we've been doing myself and Ricky have been doing some injury prevention stuff we've gone to certain yoga teacher trainings we've gone we've done them at our own center and I'm gonna definitely mine this data to even have a better um, idea of how to work on injury prevention. So what we've typically been doing is looking at common poses that cause problems, looking at common injuries, and then breaking down the biomechanics of how it's working and trying to help teachers to understand. And we understand when there's 50 people in a class, it's so hard to, like especially if it's like you're just seeing rows and rows of heads, like it's probably hard to monitor that. But at least if you guys can spot very risky behavior or, for instance, we brought this up before and I had a backlash the first time, but should we really be teaching shoulder stand or headstand in level one classes? Because a lot of them don't have the basic foundation to do those poses without, let's say, compressing their neck because all their body weight's going through. Should hypermobile uh, yogis be in the same class as non-hypermobile yogis? Because it appears in my data set that hypermobile people have the higher injury rates. And so I almost feel like should they have their own class wearing something like the body braid where they cannot, you know, because they have, yeah, is that a laugh of you're crazy or is that a laugh of you're making no, sense? Because before, because a few years ago when I suggested this, people were attacking. <coughs> and when I, ta when I talked about not teaching shoulder stand or headstand, it was like heresy to say that. In, in level one class, though, it is a little bit risky when you don't know who's in that room, right? Um, but hypermobile people, should they have their own class where it's just focused on strength? Because we know they all have poor proprioception. They all go too far in their poses. Mm -hmm. Should we be doing a class where it's just focused on strengthening and not putting those people at risk by putting them in classes where we're encouraging going to end range stretching? Mm -hmm. So these are things fundamentally that I think we need to look at. Should Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, should we be doing the same series of poses day after day, or if the person's going to go several times a week, should we change the sequence so it's not the same thing? Again, these are not questions for me to answer. You guys are the teachers, you're the experts on the actual poses and the asanas. I mean, you, these are questions that it should be a dialogue, I guess, to come up with. Um, is there anything else we've talked about? I think we covered it yeah. all. I'm sure that there'll be <laughs> questions and comments coming up, but I just want to reiterate that I do think that yoga is a very valuable uh, practice. I do use it extensively for my patients. I've had very good success using yoga and Pilates for that matter. Um, I just want to make sure that my people are safe. And I'm just hoping that if the medical community dialogues with the yoga community, that it will be safer for everybody because, I mean, we have the same first principle, <laughs> which is do no harm. And so if we do things blindly without looking, if we don't examine what we're doing, if we don't mind data, then I think we're not going to come to that conclusion. And thank you so much for this. <laughs>